a while. Technically, it's been since June that we all came together as uh, part of the big table. So this is, if you can believe it, for those of you that have been here since big table number one, we this is big table number six. Uh, so we've come a long way. Uh, we first met back in spring 2020, and here we are in uh, in fall 2022. Um, and uh, again, I think what you'll hear today from uh, numerous presenters is uh, that we've we've made a lot of progress. The whole purpose behind this process is to maximize the uh, opportunity for local hiring uh, as part of this once in a generation project uh, that is uh, the Interstate 81 project. And um, again, we are uh, getting closer and closer by the day, both in terms of our opportunities to put people to work, um, uh, also as it relates to the overall project. Uh, and you'll hear more from our partners at New York State DOT. Uh, I always want to, uh, remind people that we wouldn't be here in this uh, in this format without our partners at the Urban Jobs Task Force, UJTF. Um, the, the big table was, uh, was, was their idea uh, and something they encouraged us to do. And I'm very grateful uh, to them uh, that, uh, that we did, that we took their advice. Uh, so thank you to UJTF. Um, I, there's too many people on here to recognize, but I am gonna recognize some of uh, our fellow public servants um, Joe Nemi from Senator Schumer's office. Senator Schumer has been a, a great champion and partner of the project, uh, the 81 project, as well as this process, as has Senator Gillibrand and, uh, and uh, Jamie Fuse on, on Senator Gillibrand's team. So thank you both. Um, we have uh, Alexis C uh, Castaneda uh, from Congressman Katko's office. Thank you for joining us. Tracy D. Genova from Governor Hochul's office. Sherry Dozier Owens from Comptroller DiNapoli's office. John Moss from uh, New York State Attorney General Letitia James's office. I think I saw Assemblyman Al Sturpey on with us. Uh, Zach Zeliff from Senator Rachel May's office. Greg Zawicki from Assembly Transportation Chair Magnarelli's office. Lisa Sacco with Assemblywoman Hunter. Uh, um, I want to uh, just acknowledge that uh, two of our common counselors that uh, otherwise would be participating, our common council president, Helen Hudson, who again has been an integral partner in this process, um, as well as uh, Jen Schultz, uh, who is our common council transportation chair, are both upstairs uh, talking about garbage right now because um, that's uh, important too. And we are working on uh, uh, modernizing our, our sanitation process. So we couldn't help uh, but couldn't help avoid the scheduling conflict there. So shout out to our counselors involved in the process. Um, also want to acknowledge two uh, fellow city colleagues that are uh, relatively new to this table or at least in their current capacity. So of course, uh, common counselor or former common counselor, Joe Driscoll, who did previously chair the transportation uh, committee is now our Interstate 81 city project director. So thrilled to have uh, Joe with us uh, in that capacity. Also want to recognize Yolanda Johnson, who is our uh, the city's new director of minority affairs. Uh, welcome Yolanda to the big table. Um, I would also like to recognize our uh, state and federal transportation partners. Of course, our, uh, our close partners at New York State Department of Transportation, and you'll be hearing from Mark Frechette and his team shortly, as well as uh, at the Federal Highway Administration. We've had consistent uh, uh, participation from FHWA. Um, also on the state level, New York State Department of Labor, critical partner uh, that is with us as well. So as I mentioned, you're gonna hear a lot about the progress that we've made to date. Um, that progress has uh, largely been um, uh, been due to not only the, the individuals and organizations represented around this table, but our collective commitment to transparency and collaboration. Uh, that, that's the key. It works, it's working, um, but as you'll also hear, we have a lot more work to do. Um, so um, with that, again, just want to um, you know, reorient us towards the, the ultimate objective here, which is to maximize local hiring opportunities, particularly among historically marginalized communities, communities of color, women, uh, and other underrepresented groups. That's what this is all about. And, uh, and I'm very grateful for all of your partnership uh, in, uh, in working towards that goal. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Deputy Mayor Owens, uh, who is gonna walk us through the agenda and get us started. Sharon, you're up. Thanks everybody. Deputy Mayor, uh, as in previous big tables, uh, I wanna welcome you and my task today is to facilitate the meeting to keep us moving along a pretty full agenda today. 
Um, based on last meeting, we definitely realized we needed to extend this for two hours. Thank you all for accommodating another 30 minutes for some very important topics. The mayor set us off in the right direction. He was allocated for five minutes and he was right on target in that time frame. So I'm going to, each time I move through a section, I'm going to remind the speakers of their time frame, ask you to please monitor yourself for that time frame so we don't get to the end of the agenda and run out of time. And also um, be mindful presenters that during the course of your discussion and your time frame, we do want to leave um, opportunities for questions as well. So keeping your keeping that in mind. And with that, um, you see the um, first part of our agenda here. Um, and we're going to start with our I-81 Viaduct Project update. 15 minutes for Mark Frechette and Betsy Parmley. Thank you, Sharon, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to really focus in on what's been going on um, most recently uh, over the summertime uh, and really what's going to be happening from the construction standpoint. Uh, so we had made a decision uh, after we had gotten to the record of decision uh, to break the project down into some individual uh, components. And so we've landed on, um, we, we've had two phases of, of work. Uh, in phase one, we have five contracts that uh, we are spending most of our time trying to get those to the construction phases. Uh, I've been doing this a long time, 37 years, and Never had to try to get a billion dollars worth of construction work out the door, uh, but it's good to be at this phase. It's, it's good to be uh, working towards um, uh, something that's really going to turn the dials in, in central New York. Um, so phase one has five contracts. Phase two, which doesn't begin until the end of 2025, uh, work will be really going in 2026 through 2028 in phase two has three contracts and uh, that's going to be over 1.2 billion dollars worth of, of construction work then too. So uh, Greg just brought up a map of, of kind of what's going on downtown of the, the eight different projects. But what I wanted to say related to this was uh, we really took a look at uh, how we could maximize the ability for our local contractors to be able to bid these contracts. Um, we recognized pretty early on that if we were to put out a billion dollar one project that um, we weren't going to be successful in, in having uh, local contractors be able to, to bid that large of, of a contract. Uh, so, Part of the process was to um, have some different size projects, some that range in the $75 million range, some that our highest one is like $650 million contracts uh, in phase two. Um, but we, we purposely did that for the competitiveness of the, of the community uh, in our contracting industry. The other thing that we did um, is over the next year, what you're going to see is this five contracts will go out to go out to bid and we've separated them by a good two to three months each, each of them. Um, what happens in the construction industry is, is we, we put out a big project, the one project that um, we contract one. And I'll talk a little bit about these contracts. Uh, is a $250 million contract. And um, we wanted to separate by a couple months, contract two, contract three, contract four, and, and contract five, such that if uh, contractors bid the, the initial contracts and, and are not successful, they're going to be able to bid some of the later contracts, knowing that they're not going to get some of that work. We also saw that as a way to really maximize the abilities of the local contracting industry that has never seen this level of construction before. DOT has it in central New York. Um, it's a lot of, uh, of hours, a lot of labor, a lot of resources. Um, so 
I'm going to give you a, a bit of an update on on the phase. The first five contracts contract 1 is up at the northern interchange. It's I 81 and I 41. The conversion of that interchange to uh, business loop 81 and interstate 81. Uh, and that project goes to the Kirkville interchange. Uh, it includes a full rebuild of that interchange and an expansion of I-41 in many sections from two lanes out to three lanes and in, in each direction. Uh, we are in the contractor procurement stage. We've short shortlisted the contractors um, and we're going to be doing a best value selection. So that is the first contract that uh, we have not selected a contractor yet. Uh, but we are looking to have a groundbreaking ceremony uh, on this contract sometime later this year. Um, can't really reveal where we sit uh, related to the contractor selection, but um, know that that's the first one out the door. Um, our groundbreaking ceremony will be downtown because it signifies the elimination of the viaduct through, through the interstate system. Uh, so that's moving forward very well. We've had very good uh, dialogue with the contracting industry that, that was shortlisted on, on, that, con on that specific contract. Uh, contract two is the uh, Southern Interchange. It's I-81 and I-41, that conversion to Business Loop 81 and um, Interstate 81. And that'll go all the way to Kirkville Interchange. Uh, that's a full rebuild of that interchange. A lot of work to the replacing Brighton East Glen Ave bridge. Uh, there's a lot of interstate work there to create that that new interchange. Uh, this contract includes all the upgrades that we'll be doing along the existing interstate 41 corridor at exit three. Uh, we do work on route five and 92. We're expanding near Linden Corners. Um, this contract includes the I-41 over CSX expansion. Uh, we will be taking that bridge and, and making that wider from two, two lanes to three lanes. And that in itself is a viaduct. It's 2,100 feet long, that, that, vi that viaduct that goes over CSX. Uh, we are in the process of shortlisting uh, the contractors for, for contract two. In early next year, in 2023, we'll also be making a best value uh, contractor selection. Um, contract three is uh, shown here in the yellow. Uh, this is the downtown work. This is what I call the Northern, Northern Inner Harbor project. This is really a preparatory project uh, to be able to eliminate the, the viaduct downtown. Uh, this includes um, rebuilding Clinton Street, which runs parallel to, to I-81, uh, and extending Clinton Street down to Butternut Street. Uh, we have some upgrades to the Bear Street corridor uh, as it ties in with I-690, some, some ramp work to do there. We have four bridge replacements that we're doing here. We're doing the Court, Spencer, and Bear Street bridges. Uh, over the existing I-81, um, and we're going out to bid on this contract uh, in the spring of 2023, um, a couple months after the contract two is, is designated. Um, and those projects, we've had great meetings with the city. Uh, we've been talking about aesthetics. We've been talking about ped bike accommodations. We've been talking about parking and lighting. Um, and uh, very pleased with the collaboration that's been going on between the city and the state related to um, all these downtown projects that are going to be in construction next year. Um, contract four is what's shown in blue. Uh, this is the new I-690 um, interchange at Kraus and Irving. It includes uh, six bridges uh, because we are replacing the two Lodi Street bridges as part of this. Uh, this project really picks up from where we ended off on I-690 for the Teal Beach project uh, that we completed a couple years ago. And it'll go uh, west of Irving Street 
this is really the new gateway uh, to University Hill. Uh, people coming in from the west, from Camillus, people coming in from the east, from DeWitt, people coming in from the Nora, Clay, Clay Cicero, will have direct access to the hill via this new interchange that doesn't exist today. We have significant upgrades to Kraus and Irving up to Adams Street that we'll be performing as part of this project. Uh, it is our plan to uh, go out to bid with the uh, selecting contractors uh, next summer, summer 2023, uh, for this uh, Kraus Irving uh, project, which is contract four. Our last contract uh, that we'll be going out to bid on is the southern piece, which is shown down here in the orange. Uh, this work uh, goes from Birch Street, which is really right next to Bill Simmons Syracuse Housing Authority, down to the Colvin Street uh, area for contract five. This includes replacing the railroad bridge, uh, the NYS and W Railroad Bridge over the new business loop 81. Uh, we'll be building the, the roundabout at Van Buren Street to create some new access up to the university that way. We have the Colvin Street northbound off ramp uh, that will create new avenues to the south side, to the uh, outer Comstock neighborhoods, and also to the backside of the, the university. Um, we're looking to secure a contractor for this contract five uh, in the fall of 2023. Uh, all five of these projects will be in construction by the end of the year, uh, a little bit at different, different phases. But what's important with all five of these is that, um, that the construction, uh, which is scheduled to be completed by the end of 2025, uh, a three year time frame is that the viaduct remains uh, open to the public and the impacts of getting into and out of the city, uh, people will still be able to use ID1 until such time that these five contracts are constructed and um, there'll come a day where we'll close down the interstate that will start the dismantling of the viaduct through the city, but it won't occur until we get these components like the crowd serving where people will be able to utilize that with the viaduct gone. So uh, a lot of work going on in, in phase one. Uh, certainly we have a lot of work to do in phase two, which also is all downtown, uh, which will do 690, uh, and it'll create the business loop 81, north of 690, and then also south of 690. Uh, but our focus really is getting these projects out the, out the door um, there is, um, um, labor is a big part of that. There's been great conversation. I want to thank everybody for participating in this committee, uh, because it's really setting the trend nationally on some things that we've never done before. So we're looking forward to incorporating much of that, uh, on all of these five contracts, um, and, um, in, in, in really getting into the construction phases. With that, I'll, I'll hopefully I didn't go over my 15 minutes, Sharon. You did not, and you actually gave us a, a few minutes. Uh, there's a question in the chat, Mark. Will there be opportunity for local DBE contractors who were not included in the bid submitted by three shortlist firms for contract one? Can someone on your team talk about that? Yeah, sure. So uh, DBE requirements uh, for contract one, uh, Betsy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're around 10%. Uh, so, uh, the 10% of the construction work will be performed by DBEs. Uh, we're at the stage where we're really trying to get to a point where um, we're selecting uh, the contractors that are going to build it. There's a lot of sub subcontractors that will work for the prime contractors, a lot of opportunities for DBEs, not only on contract one, but also on future contracts that are going to come uh, down the pike here as part of the other four contracts. So, Mark, just for clarity, for the um, bids that were submitted by the three uh, firms, there is still opportunity for subcontract work in those bids? We we have 
it's it's the best value selection, Sharon, where we are going to try to select the best contractor for Central New York to build contract one. And um, you know, DBE is a part of, of that process. And um, so we take everything into consideration, but but those requirements of meeting that 10% are very important in the selection process. Any other questions for Mark? Okay, thank you, Mark. Yep. Our next section is around community expectations for local hiring. Um, we have uh, four individuals. I'm not sure if all of them, if people can help me see if they're, if they're all here yet. Um, but, yeah. Right now, we don't have Lanessa. Okay. Um, maybe she'll join us as we go midstream through this, but I do see that Deca, uh, Oshana, and I believe Joss are all on. Okay, so we have 15 minutes, Sada, for this section, um, and, we will, and we will start in the order, um, skipping Lanessa to the bottom um, of these um, speakers, Deca, Oceana, Josh, and then Lanessa. Hopefully, um, we text her. Hopefully, she'll be on board. Um, I encourage all of the, so that we can have, um, the, the, there are four people slated for 15 minutes, so we want to give them an opportunity to speak. Um, questions, comments of the attendees, please put them in the chat. Please put them in the chat. And so, uh, Deca, we will start with you, as um, I believe is appropriate. All right, thanks, Sharon. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to try to be brief. As the mayor said, I want to acknowledge all that's been accomplished so far by this group that you're going to hear a little bit about um, today. You've been hearing about, but also want to say that there's more um, to be done. So this part of today's agenda is about accountability. Um, increasingly, as time goes on, the eyes of the nation are upon us. And more importantly, I want to say that the community is watching us and is fully expecting for us to achieve our goal of 15% local hire on ID1. Um, I do want to remind you that the Urban Jobs Task Force is not a singular organization, but a coalition of almost two dozen community agencies in Syracuse that are dedicated to economic justice. Um, and we are supported by legal services of CMY. So I speak on behalf of all of those organizations when I say that falling short of our goal would be unacceptable, especially given the stakeholders um, involved who are, are here and who have committed to leveraging their resources, power, and efforts to make it happen. Um, as was introduced in the beginning, we have elected officials and public serving agencies from the local, state, and federal levels. We have workforce development, we have labor um, and community organizations, among others. Um, so there really is no reason why we can't collectively pull this off. And Urban Jobs Task Force, as your advocates, will continue to uh, draw attention to barriers, but also propose solutions to keep us on track and to keep us moving forward. Um, I will leave each of you uh, individuals and agencies with one simple request, which is to ask yourself um, if you've done all that you can do to help us uh, together be successful. And if you have not, or the answer to that is no for yourself, um, I'll say to you that now is the perfect time to consider what more you can do. Thank you. Thank you, Decca. As you have said um, very clearly and accurately, the eyes of the nation are on Syracuse. That is not an empty statement. And so it is our um, moment to shine and show what we are able to do and capable of doing here in our community on behalf of our workforce. Uh, thank you for that. Oceana. Okay, I figured it out. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm a lifelong uh, resident of Syracuse, a retired nurse and a mother of a son who aspires to a construction trades career. My family sees firsthand the good work that Syracuse Build Program is doing. 
And like other parents in Syracuse, I want our young people to benefit through employment on I-81. It is my prayer that the major stakeholders at the mayor's big table continue your hard work. You must realize the promises of your premise, jobs and jobs for local residents. I applaud the incentive structure that aspires to 15% of the work hours for local hires. You deserve recognition for that agreement. As I am sure you know, many residents feel the I-81 project should now create at least that much local opportunity. So please keep pushing. Also, I'm grateful for the positive partnership among local leaders and our construction trade leadership. I realize that a unionized workforce is known everywhere for skill and safety. No matter who gains opportunity on this project, I urge all stakeholders to ensure that all workers enjoy the highest safety protections available. Thank you. Thank you, Oceana. And um, I'm glad that um, Syracuse Build is having an impact in your family. And uh, it's doing exactly what we had hoped it would do and we wanna to continue to build upon it. Uh, Josh. Yeah, Josh. Thank, yeah, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm speaking today as a member of the Urban, of the urban Jobs Task Force of Syracuse, um, but also as a representative of Planned Parenthood of Central and Western New York, and a member of the Board for Cooperative Federal Credit Union. I'm here today to emphasize the necessity of at least 15% local hire on the 81 rebuild. Those living closest to the viaduct have experienced and will continue to experience its most direct impacts. In accordance with the social determinants of health, economic stability affects a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes. We know that economic inequality is concentrated in our city as a result of the policies and infrastructural choices made during the construction of the original viaduct. Thus, failure to achieve the maximum possible local and minority hire on this rebuild would mark a failure of racial equity and public health. I know that the convening of this big table demonstrates that these values are shared and the initial steps towards local hire have already gained national publicity. But we also know that intent is different than impact, and it is easier to allow the many challenges and barriers to local hire to overcome our ability to pave a more equitable path forward. So I am here to encourage, in the strongest possible terms, that this leadership body ensures robust local and minority hire. If we do not fight for conditions to change, particularly when obstacles to justice arise, then we cannot hope for an equitable future for our community nor pretend as if we are making sound infrastructural decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I do not see Lanessa. Um, so I will absolutely take the opportunity. I was gonna jump in uh, later on with Scott Butler and I will jump again <laughs> when that happens. But when we talk about this opportunity to reach that 15%, um, we have a great pathway through uh, Syracuse Build and Pathways to Apprenticeship. But folks, we have to begin to really think about how we're going to double and triple and quadruple down on the numbers of people that are going through that program. We have got to expand it. And, and I know that Amy is going to be ready to talk about this her and, and, and that team. But since we're talking about it and we have still a few minutes left, I just want to make the emphasis that we're at a critical point where we have to begin to identify resources to continue to support that program. So there is a pipeline of eligible individuals to be able to do this work on the project. We have the model. We have the model that's recognized across this country. We have to fund it. We have to fund it efficiently and effectively moving forward. Thank you to that team um, for that um, presentation and all of your, and I see a question, can we have Syracuse Bill do a trade fair in the local high schools like the college fair? Absolutely. Um, we would send that, get that message to uh, Chris, Chris Montgomery, absolutely. Any other questions for any other folks that really have been on the ground, um, moving, pushing for this 15% um, local hire? This question is for Mott Scott or anyone on DLT. What have you heard, reactions, concern, optimism from contractors and labor about the 15% hire provision? Marker Scott. 
I can. Uh, okay. Mechanics, how it's going to work for them. Um, nothing I would say that has derailed us in any way, shape, or form. Um, so it's been a lot of mechanics, how it's going to work and how they expect it to work, how they plan to do it. But I think they see the incentive and the opportunity to do it and are finding ways to make it work for themselves. Um, I would Scott, put it in a positive. It's been positive. Yeah. There's been no negative. Right. Is there anything that you're getting from comments? You know, we baked the cake. We think we got all the right ingredients. Anything that you're hearing that we should be looking at for um, any program that operates is not worth its weight in gold if it's not ready to flex and build and, and adjust its its ability. Um, anything you're getting from any of the contractors that would cause us to want to modify either Syracuse Build Pathways or WorkSmart? Nothing yet. I think I would hold that until we see proposals and see how they plan to implement it. Um, but I would also add for all our partners, and I was going to bring this up later if you want me to wait on it. Um, no, but we're having it. those time. we're having those conversations. We're bringing you know Syracuse Build Center State TEO. SUNY EOC and what we're doing with the collaborative, the local hire collaborative that we've created, we're bringing that to the contractors um, and saying, we have this resource, we're going to help you make this work. Work with us. Okay. We want to make sure that all of the programs that are pulled together around workforce are nimble enough to make the Correct. adjustments necessary. Correct. Sharon, um, if, if I could add, uh, Dave's yes. here. Just, just to add, just uh, the first meeting that we had where we brought in the design build teams and the DBEs, and I, and I know it's on the agenda later. I don't want to jump ahead to that necessarily, but, but just to make the point here that the, the nice thing that we all saw at that meeting was that there was great participation. And so that bodes well for, for overall participation with the, with the project. So just to point that out, um, and, and I forget who asked the question, but, but there was really good participation on both sides for potential DBEs as well as the design build teams that are competing for contract one. So more of those meetings to come, but, but, you know, it, it bodes well that uh, we, we are seeing great participation already. So that's good. So I would just uh, add to the, for the DOT team, one thing about this project and what is getting the attention across the nation is that um, we are not um, moving forward on this in the usual status quo methodologies. Um, even when we talked about labor and, you know, the rubber has to re meet the road to deck in the other speaker's point. But I would also encourage that on the DBE side of thing and for business opportunities as well. Um, really um, thinking outside the box and encouraging from the DOT, the emphasize for the contractors who on federal projects um, May may or may not be just used to a, a system by which they identify who their subs are going to be in, in this community and under this project. We want to think outside of that box. Aaron, we've got a question from Mache regarding deadline for potential subcontractors. I think we we can probably bring that up a little bit later in the agenda. We can make sure we come back to that during Scott's section. I want Mache to know we're uh, we're on top of it. Well, I, I think actually that the, we have a few minutes here. This is probably oh, a better okay. place because uh, the the next section is really around workforce. And so this is opportunity to talk about business. Um, I just want to emphasize the big table really came around the table around really making sure the workforce is on the project, but we cannot forget our local business and we need to put as much energy behind that topic as well. So um, if anyone from the DOT team um, would like to um, take on that question. And Greg, can you repeat it? Yeah, I'm going to hit uh, uh, Mache's question in the chat is, what is the associated deadline date for potential subcontractors to apply to the primes as a sub for phases one and two? And I think that's a, a Scott Mark question, or at least one for us to direct to how we get the answers. I, I can answer that. Um, you know, subcontractors um, uh, on on each of our contracts. Um, I'll just use as an example the um, Peel Beach project, uh, which is relatively small in nature in comparison to the eighty one project. That was a 
70 million dollar project all of these projects i talked about are are significantly more um, we have one that's under 100 million but all the other contracts are over 100 million um, in that contract we had uh, our agreement with the prime contract is with the prime contractor but on that that i-690 over teal beach there were something like 60 subcontractors some would just come in for some guide rail, some came in for the demolition, some came in for signage, some came in for uh, multiple different mechanisms. So right now, as it relates to contract one, um, where we're reviewing um, a, a selection, um, depending upon who the prime contractor is, will all ultimately dictate some of the subcontractors. So we're just not in a mode at this point in time uh, to be able to speak to that related to contract one, uh, but recognize that there is a lot of opportunity for subcontractors to be a part of any one of the five contracts and multiple subcontractors will work on each of the projects. So, you know, we're building the pieces of the puzzles by first off selecting the best value prime contractor. Uh, the agreements with the subcontractors will be with the prime. Um, and we're just not at that stage to be able to talk about the, the subcontractors um, because we have not selected a prime yet. So, Joe, um, make sure I'm getting this right, Joe. You're making the point that the the deadline has passed for contract one. Correct, correct, Sharon. Um, according to the three shortlisted joint venture firms, that, that deadline has passed to submit uh, quotes or proposals to the prime contractor submitting to DOT. And so, and so, Joseph, just to to, just to to straighten out that question, to pull out that question a little bit more, does that deadline close these further DBE opportunities? Is that an accurate? Um, I'm, I'm, this is just according to the three shortlisted firms. Okay. I, I'm not sure what how that plays out. If there's more opportunity once DOT selects a short uh -huh. one of those shortlisted JV firms. Um, that's just according to those firms. Is that is that the process DOT team that after you select further um, review takes place? So Sharon, as it relates to DBE, we are going to be managing uh, these contracts and ensuring that the prime contractor gets to that 10% DBE level. Um, we are at the proposal stage, not the end of construction. So that is something that over the next three years, we'll be working with the prime contractor. We have list of DBEs here also. So we need to get to the point to understand who is going to be the prime. Um, and, and, you know, DBE is a portion, is a part of that in the selection process, but recognize that the construction duration uh, we'll go for the next three years, and the prime contractor will be bringing on DBEs um, to be able to perform some of the work. Yeah, let me uh, let me just add a little bit. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think it's it's important to understand two things here. One is that, as Mark said earlier, we're in the the procurement stage for contract one, and therefore um, the three design build teams are competing for contract one. And to do that, they need to put together proposals. So probably, and, and I'm assuming what Joe is referring to is, is a deadline that was set so that um, the prime contractors, the potential prime contractors could include DB information in their proposals. That doesn't preclude later on. So that's, that's one. Secondly, that doesn't preclude later on, once we get into construction, those conversations from taking place between potential DBEs in contractors, because as we progress through the contracts, you know, things will change and, you know, contractors will come and go 
depending on the specific function that they're going to perform. So, so there's a, li a little bit of a difference there, but that's where we are in the process. We can't get too deep into that conversation only because we are in the procurement, but there's, there's a little bit of a difference to understand there. And so uh, one suggestion I would make is um, um, the event I will agree at, on, uh, at uh, the on center was great. Um, maybe more opportunities. Um, yep, moving on, but I just want to make this point. Um, more opportunities um, for um, the explanation of the process because it is a very complicated uh, uh, project. Thank you, uh, uh, team, for that. And we'll be moving on now to the unfolding story and lessons of the big table. Um, we have a team of speakers here for 20 minutes, Rochester Local Hiring Day, which I also participated with the mayor um, in Rochester and uh, our DBE workshop that we just completed. We were just, uh, that topic is on time. And um, the F FHWA roadmap um, publication that is being pulled together based on what's been going on here in central New York. So we will start with Jamie and then move to Jackie and Sonia and then to Kara Hogan. And please keep in mind we want time for Q&A, 20 minutes. Jamie? Sure. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so uh, I think most of you know me by now, but uh, my name is Jamie Thieves. I'm the Central New York Regional Director for Senator Gilbrand. Um, first off, uh, thank you, Mayor Walsh and Deputy Mayor Owens, um, for your leadership on this project and the opportunity to speak. Um, and as you alluded to, uh, Deputy Mayor, this summer uh, we gathered more than 40 local leaders between Syracuse and Rochester. Um, for a collaborative working session uh, to learn and share expertise around local hiring practices. Um, specifically, we were asking the difficult questions of how do we build a pipeline of local talent? What will training look like? What role does the union labor play? Um, and so to do this, we called on several leaders in both the Rochester and Syracuse communities to speak to their areas of expertise. Uh, Mayor Walsh and Mayor Evans uh, kicked off the event in Rochester, um, giving backgrounds on their respective product projects, uh, 81 here in Syracuse, of course, and the inner loop in Rochester. Uh, I... uh, okay, we're good. <laughs> um, Rochester is in an interesting position um, that they've brought part of the inner loop up to level street level, and they did that in 2014. Um, and they're about to embark on raising another portion of it. Uh, so while they've tackled this issue before, um, they have yet to do it with the additional tool that we're going to have here in Syracuse, which is the opportunity for local hire. Um, and so this was kind of the purpose of our meeting uh, to, to describe how Syracuse has started off on this endeavor for local hire. Um, and so to give a little bit of background here, which I'm sure many of you know, uh, in 2019, the Senator introduced the legislation, build local, hire local. Uh, and while I was a fellow um, in Senator Gillibrand's legislative office, so I was based in DC, um, I had the unique opportunity to work with our Syracuse team uh, to help write that bill. Um, but it wasn't until the end of last year uh, under the $1.2 trillion Congressional Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that the language from her bill was adopted. Um, so that was enabling government, labor, and community organizations to work together and connect local workers, particularly those who are disadvantaged and underrepresented to con construction jobs that will directly impact their communities. As we all know, this country has a deep and long history of using infrastructure as a tool to exclude and marginalize communities of color. A big thank you goes out to Deputy Mayor Owens and Decca Dansel of the Urban Jobs Task Force, who, after the mayor's presentation, led a session on mission alignment, um, establishing continuity between Syracuse and Rochester coalitions around a local hiring mission for equity. Um, as we rebuild our nation's aging infrastructure, we have a unique opportunity to right the wrongs of the past by making investments that will help build generational wealth in every community. Our road projects are one of those investments. 
From there, Deputy Mayor Owens and Samin Bannister from Rochester spoke on how to measure success and three working groups of labor, community outreach and workforce were created to discuss how each community has activated around building a local workforce pipeline. Um, with every meeting we have, uh, particularly this one, uh, it's clear that it takes all of these voices, labor, workforce development organizations, community advocates, and yes, government to activate and move forward these projects. Ultimately, we came away with two very important next steps. Uh, one, the Rochester Coalition is starting conversations to establish their own big table discussions to ensure that the community at large is heard. And two, our office um, will be convening stakeholders across New York State to further spread the message that with all of these highway projects, there needs to be mission alignment around a focus for equity and for building community wealth. Uh, I look forward to sharing more about this, this summit as the details get hammered out. <laughs> um, it's already been a long road, but in many ways, the work is only just getting started here in Syracuse. Um, it was this group here that propelled a movement around local hiring, uh, ultimately leading to the Senators Build Local, Hire Local legislation. And we hope to continue to learn from the leadership Syracuse is providing around the 81 project um, and bring the lessons learned here across the state and ultimately across the nation. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you. See uh, Sandra on the call. Um, we can go to DBE workshop. Jackie and Sandra. Thank you, Deputy uh, Mayor Owens. I um, just want to make a few uh, introductory remarks, and I think Jackie and Scott. I, I have to take another call. I'm sorry. So Jackie and Scott will pick up. Um, the conversation, but there are a few things I want to say. I want to say thank you um, um, for allowing the Office of Diversity of the Department of Transportation to partner with you on this on this um, historic effort. Um, one of the things that struck me is that I, I hear many um, folks on the call talk about partnerships, um, and it's very important to us. We are very proud and we are very honored to be part of this partnership. And it's very important to us that when we, um, you know, that 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 we react and that we respond when we hear words like impact and when we hear words like, you know, we don't want this to be a failure. But it's very important to us that the folks on the call know that we certainly do see you as partners. And when we call on you to provide us with information, help us find a place to meet, help us find folks to talk to that we are calling upon you as partners. We need you and we really, um, you know, we really respect and regard your assistance to us in that in that manner. So uh, your partnership is important to us. So it's very important that we continue that partnership um, so that we, we also don't want to <laughs> fail in this effort. And we also uh, significantly feel the impacts of what we're doing here. Um, the other thing I wanted to say just before I got off, we're going to talk about, I'm going to let the other folks talk about what I think was a great success in terms of the workshop, but we absolutely have plans, uh, Deputy Mayor, on um, having additional workshops that will help answer many, many questions about the process and how a DBE becomes involved and how a DBE becomes certified. And what is a DBE? I mean, we have plans to have those discussions throughout the city of Syracuse. We're working diligently to beef up our, 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 our staff so that we have enough people to answer the questions and be involved um, um, in all of the various community engagements that are happening across the, uh, the city. So um, I, I do agree, it's a complicated process. There, there, we, we've already been getting calls about you know, missed opportunities and um, and we're learning, of course we're learning, but it is important, that every, as everyone said, is that the opportunity, the, the, the construction hasn't really even started yet. And so I think it's a, an a unfamiliarity with the process that folks are thinking that there's been missed opportunities. So we definitely need to get out there and do some, um, some, some, some educating and we plan on doing that. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to stop there, Scott, and I'm going to let Scott and Jackie take over for me. Um, and, you know, my we're, we're always open to new ideas, new suggestions, or everyone, I think, has our phone numbers. <laughs> we're, um, you know, and we're always uh, willing to talk about DBEs. We've hired consultants. We've hired, we're hiring additional staff. We, we plan on being here for the long haul in terms of helping people get. So we're not only with the DBE program, but with, you know, the workforce um, initiative, we're, we're, we're here and we're open to suggestions and ideas. We work with many people on the call and we, um, you know, we're here and we're in it. And we'd ask that you uh, give us a call if you need to. Thank you, Sandra. Any other team members? The only thing I would add to that is a big thank you to the community writ large. I think that was the first time we had done an outreach event specifically for DBEs and the attendance was through the roof. And I really just got to commend everybody, not only who helped us get people there from the county and from the city, but also the attendees themselves. There were a lot of very, very good questions uh, from that community about how this will work. And I think, you know, just hearing some other things today, we do still have some education to do. And as Sandra said, we're going to be out there. You're going to see us. Uh, we're going to be continuing to work with the one stop that I know that is coming. So to make sure that people have as much of an opportunity as humanly possible. So. Uh, Jackie, anything from you? I don't want to overlook you. No, nope, that's fine. Um, I just want to um, piggyback off of what Sandra says, just to um, add that we will be back out in Syracuse um, hosting um, another outreach event in regards to the um, workforce. Um, and Scott, I don't know if you wanted to talk about that. We, we're looking to be out there maybe November 3rd or November 4th. We're just looking for a location right now, and we're going to do that um, outreach in the zip codes that have been identified um, to make them aware of the uh, uh, local hiring. And we'll, we'll be also um, meeting with additional um, DBEs, inviting DBEs and primes to that outreach session as well to um, make them aware of what their responsibilities are for that local hiring. Um, just wanted to put that out there and we will continually be having uh, DBE sessions, DBE certification sessions ongoing um, on a every other month basis. And we also look to for the second contract that will be coming out to have another DBE workshop as we did with the shortlisted for the first contract. Thank you. Any questions? I will move on to Kara. Can you hear me? Yes, just really yeah, quick. Just really um, um, yep, we can hear you, Kara. Is it echoing? It is. Do you I'm have sorry. two lines? I always have, have this problem with. Uh, Webex and now I just hung up. So uh, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me, Sharon. Okay. I can't hear any of you. So hopefully no one has any questions. <laughs> um, so this summer federal highway has been writing a document that tells the story about workforce development on I 81. Um, as Sharon said, so eloquently earlier, the eyes of the nation are on us and that's true at federal highway too. We've been asked repeatedly because local higher preference is now authorized under the bipartisan infrastructure law. What have we done in Syracuse? We're one of the few examples out there of a local higher preference on a federal highway project. So in an effort to share our story and what we've learned, we've created this roadmap. Um, of course, we wanted to have a, a road metaphor because we're federal highway, um, but we're hoping this is a resource that can be used uh, to share with other state DOTs, other federal highway division offices to explain uh, a lot of what we've talked about on this call today, that it's not as simple as just a specification in a contract. This took a pipeline from recruitment to 
training to placement on the job. Um, so we want to be able to share the whole story. Um, and as you can imagine, it's it's usually a three hour conversation. So we've condensed it into a small book um, so that we can aid in that story sharing. Um, and especially because of the strong community stakeholder involvement that was necessary, the collaborative partnership from a variety of perspectives and expertise. I know we spent months writing the spec, thinking out all the details. So all of that's included in the roadmap um, and it's in its final draft stages. So th big thank you to a lot of you on this call who helped write it. Um, nice out of course, the city, Urban Jobs Task Force, Center State CEO, Syracuse Build, SUNY EOC, um, large contributors to the document. Um, the goal is that we will be able to collectively use this as a resource as we work with others within our state and outside of our state uh, that are interested in implementing local hire successfully. Um, and that they're able to learn from what we've done, take bits and pieces from our model that will work for them um, and that we'll be able to share what we've learned because I know we looked for that as we embarked on setting out with this local hire preference. Where were the good examples? Um, so hopefully we can be one of those good examples for others. Um, the, the, the overall goal is that it be published on Federal Highway's website as a companion resource to another great document we have. I know some of you are familiar with the playbook. Uh, it's more of a national resource document inspirational kind of how to set up a workforce development collaborative so we're envisioning that this document will really be focused on the implementation the local project specific side so um, stay tuned i'm hoping by the next time we meet i'll be able to just plop a link in the sh in the chat pod and you'll all be able to look at it and now i have to call back in so i can hear you all <laughs> She'll, she'll call back in, but I, I, I made a note in the chat, uh, you know, thank you for telling our story and, and the intention to, to share this around the country. Um, I'm going to continue to be a broken record, resources, resources, resources. This train is going to stop without um, finances. And uh, I don't want a national document and people call us and we say we don't have money to keep the program running. <laughs> Any questions for this team of presenters on the unfolding story and lessons learned? Well, everybody's doing a great job on time. So we are gonna move to um, one of the major parts of this, ap this afternoon's agenda, and that's the workforce preparation, 15% local hiring goal. Scott Butler is gonna lead a team of individuals um, who will talk about the workforce collaborative that has been established, the DOT plans and next steps, and a larger conversation around this topic area. A lot of work behind the scenes. One of the team members um, who is not here is Chris Montgomery, who is traveling, but he is well represented. Amy is on the call. Um, I think I saw Ebony. So uh, Scott, take it away. You got it. Thank you, Sharon. Um, the first and foremost would be just a quick background on what the actual collaborative is, because I think a lot of people hear us say collaborative, which we've condensed uh, down into just saying collaborative because the other name is way too long. So I won't bore everybody with the other name, but the idea behind the collaborative came from what I would say two different groups. One, when we were working on the SEP 14 application before the passage of the uh, Build Back Better, which gave us authorization to have a local hire. We were having a lot of these same conversations that are happening in the big table on a much smaller scale and figuring out how local hire would work here. But then also the department uh, through our partners at FHWA uh, seeked out and received an, uh, a grant to create the collaborative and to create this, uh, this area for us to have these conversations about, okay, how are we training people? How are we recruiting people to train? How are we recruiting people to get on the job? So the collaborative is a group of us from Urban Jobs Task Force, Onondaga County, City of Syracuse, Center State, uh, SUNY EOC, Syracuse Build, Building Trades, Associated General Contractors, and now we've been adding partners. Now that we have our local hire and we have um, 
seen what the barriers to employment were going to incentivize, we have Onondaga County DSS as a part of the group to help us steer people towards us. Onondaga Nation has joined us to help steer people towards us to start this process. So it's a becoming a big group, but we're keeping our conversations very pointed and very um, to the point. On local hire, it's in our RFP. We have the approval to have it. Our first contract, if you were to go to our website, at i81.dot.ny.gov and look on our contracts page, looks at the actual contract RFP. Local hire is there. It is in the RFP. It's happening. Um, to make it happen, though, we need to start the process of getting people ready. So we have our training partners at Syracuse Build with Pathways, at SUNY EOC and Carroll Hill with WorkSmart New York. Those folks, we are funding cohorts now. The next part of that, and Sharon, I went fast because I know you wanted to talk about this the most, and I thought we'll give the most time for it because I don't, I can answer any questions about the collaborative, who we are, what we're doing. But the important part is, is we've started this. We're creating the system or creating, not a system, we're creating the place for us to do all of the things necessary to make sure the community, as we heard at the beginning of this, has the opportunity. So we can get the resumes, we can get the hand raised that someone says, I want to do this, and they're coming to us, coming to Syracuse Build, going to a union hall, and getting on this project as someone from our zip codes that we're incentivized. So it's capacity. Amy's here, Carol's here. We wanted to let them tell you how much this is costing to put together. Uh, this <laughs> Things cost money in this world, as we all know. So I think having both Carol and Chris isn't here, but having Amy help tell us how much a cohort actually costs us to put on in both the iterations, both at WorkSmart and at uh, Pathways is important. And actually what Amy and, and Center State are doing for us in the Volunteers Legal Lawyers Project vehicle programming that we're putting together, because we're trying to create solutions to the problems we always hear. We don't want problems, we want solutions, and that's what the idea behind the collaborative is around workforce. So, Amy, you want to go first, and then Carol, kind of give us an idea about finances. Can I, can I just invoke facilitator's privilege one second before you come on, Amy? Scott, those of us that are in the weeds, we talk in the weeds language. Can you I just know. give us the 30,000 foot of exactly what the incentive program or position in the contract okay. is? Yep. Not, not a problem. So each contract will have a 15% local hire um, provision. That local hire provision will be based on city specific zip codes. We've created a two tier incentive. The first tier is just someone who lives within a city zip code. I can get, it, it's on our website, you can find, I have one of my presentations up there right now that explains it. The other incentive, so that's for $20 an hour. So a contractor on this project will be incentivized to hire within a city zip code at $20 an hour base. If that person that they find inside a city zip code has a barrier to employment, we've listed out six barriers. If they have one of those barriers, the incentive then goes to $30 per hour incentive towards the contractor. We feel like it's a, a great incentive uh, from the DOT side. You know, it's going to cost the DOT and the project about $32 million over the course of the six years duration. Um, we think it's going to work and it's on us. And that's what the workforce collaborative is to the point to make it work. Is that fast and good enough? That, yeah, that, that was both. Um, can you put the link in the chat for the references for people to look? Yep. Um, it's important for the audience to, to hear exactly what that incentive program is, because not only are you attendees, but you're ambassadors and you're ambassadors for the program to be able to know the basics. And if you can't remember the basics, memorize the link. All right, Amy and Carol, Amy. Hi, Hi everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. What, what did this amazing um, bells and whistles beautiful program costs us. Okay, so um, I just want to say 
many, many hands and hearts have brought us to this moment where we have this incredible program. Uh, I'm going to talk about pathways to apprenticeship and also talk a little bit about the vehicle vehicles to work program. So pathways to apprenticeship. I also want to um, acknowledge Ebony Farrow, who's on the call, who is the heart and soul of that program and is one of the major reasons it is so successful. Um, I just get to describe the work that she's doing. Um, I will say, so right now we are running and Ebony, please jump in if you, if I'm messing up here. Two cohorts a year. Um, we have, uh, we're paying instructors who are um, coming from union apprenticeship programs. Everyone who's in the program is receiving a stipend, a minimum wage um, for every hour that they're in the program. There's also costs for equipment, tools, after people get hired, uh, after people get into the union, union dues, and the long process that um, occurs after the program is over to actually take the test, make sure people are in apprenticeship, and being successful. So there's all kinds of services um, supporting the success of the program. So the amount that that all comes out to is about 250,000 per cohort. That's including everything. So we've been thinking about this, you know, and I think a lot more conversations we need to have with Chris about how to really do this, how to expand capacity. You could add more people in each cohort. That has pros and cons. Um, we can add more cohorts. We need another staff person. Like there's just more and more as you're talking about growing a program, it's there's there's just a lot of layers to doing that now that we've got a great rhythm going. Um, so it, we did been doing the math of how much income we have at this point in and what we need to do next in order to grow if we decided to go down the road of adding uh, of doing four cohorts in 2023 instead of just two we would need that will cost about eight hundred thousand dollars we had a great meeting with cny works um, looking at where WIOA could cover a lot of costs of pathways to apprenticeship. So I think there's a lot of great potential there. Chris and I are chasing down a lot of other leads and potential places to find revenue. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure money coming <laughs> our way um, from the Biden administration that we need to dig out where the workforce pieces of that. Um, there's apparently workforce money inside of US DOT that we're trying to pull on that thread. So there's a lot of potential revenue. I think our task this, at this point is really, um, and really led by Chris, I'm sorry, he's not here, I don't wanna speak for him um, in terms of how we do it, but that should give you kind of a general ballpark. That's definitely a ballpark figure. Um, I want to say a little bit about the vehicles to work program, which is just this like little hidden jewel inside of pathways and kudos to Ebony and her team for building that out with us. This is a program we decided we are not going to train people in construction and then just hope they find a car because you have to have a car to work in construction. So we baked into the program vehicles to work and what this program is is really the community center collaborative is really the hub of it and they've built the expertise around how do people get access to cars so what the program does also has andrew Kroom volunteer lawyers project giving people legal advice about how to repair their driver's license getting people access to purchasing cars through a loan fund that we built at cooperative federal people are getting uh, support with getting affordable insurance getting um, a vehicle repair. A lot of people need help just repairing their vehicles and paying off old fines and fees. Right now, that program is serving 30 people in the two pathways cohorts. If we were going to expand that to include all the work smart folks and other folks going through Syracuse build, that is probably about $150,000 just in staffing costs. But then we also, um, the loan fund itself, we're working with Cooperative Federal to expand the 
car loan fund so people can purchase cars. Although we're learning that's not actually a major um, strategy for a lot of people, um, although it's available. So I'll stop there. I'll hand it over to you, Carol. I will, um, before we go to Carol, I will just add that I've had this conversation with Chris because so you gave us an $800,000 number. That would be for four cohorts. That is still, um, you know, 80 people. And so, um, okay. And so um, what I've said to Chris is that we'll start with 20 and then we'll probably graduate 15. I said, we have to start starting with at least 25 people. So I would say that the cohorts moving forward, minimally, we need to add 25% on top of that number. Because if we start with 25, and get to 20, but if we had all 25 get through, that would be an additional cost. So I'm already saying that a cohort needs to be 25% more because we need to start with more people to make sure we're graduating at least the maximum that we intended the program to graduate. Uh, Carol. Hi. Yes, I am here and along with Tim Pennick. So I know Tim is uh, on the line also, and he can jump in at any time. Um, currently we have, we've been running three to four programs uh, a year, depending on the weather. Construction is one of those that gets seasonal. So we try not to run something between like November and in January, only because we want to make sure when they graduate that, that they get a job. So we have two different types of construction training programs. One is designed specifically for highway and the other one is more building maintenance. So, you know, as we find and you look at capacity, once we get over a number of 10 to 12 students, we will have to hire another instructor just for safety costs. So the cost of our program, again, we are a, a educational institution and we're pretty basic. Uh, we have been uh, the cost of our program for the instructor, the tools and the safety equipment runs about $20,000. Now that does not include our staff uh, and a lot of other ancillary things that we have been picking up. So, you know, as, as we look at increasing this, you know, that's where we know that staffing is going to come into play and other things that we will need to do. But we've also relied very heavily upon our community partners to provide stipends to provide any other the other services that are needed. So that's where, as Amy had said, these services are vital. We see the difference where students are getting stipends compared to those that don't and the retention rate is higher. So we have seen that that does make a difference. So as we look at capacity, and this is where I was hoping Tim would jump in uh, to start talking about capacity, not only for this, but as we look at the CDL training program that we're working on. Please speak more about the CDL program. Sure, we're looking at a program that will have three components to it. One will be the classroom component. The other one will be the uh, CDL simulator and then the on the road training. So with that training, we're looking at a, uh, a continuous enrollment so that as we move somebody from a classroom, we can then move them into the the CDL training, uh, the simulator training, and then the on the road training. Uh, a number of partners, including DOT, that is helping us along with the city. So, number of partners on that. Um, EOC will become a training provider, will be a registered training provider, and hire multiple instructors to be able to, to meet some of these needs. And if I could just jump in really quickly, just to highlight from what you heard from Amy what you've heard from Carol, this is, this is the collaborative. We're finding solutions to these problems. CDL, train CDL drivers is going to be something that becomes a big need on this project. And so finding a solution to that training need is what the collaborative is here to do. So for all of those wondering what we're doing, this is what we're doing. And we're having these conversations. And then I'm gonna kick it, because I know She's mentioned it and hinted at it three different times, so she can take her facilitator's hand off if she wants and be a commenter. Is it started at the 
end of our last collaborative meeting to start this conversation and she wanted to bring it up here. So I'll let Sharon jump in on it is capacity. As you can hear, we're hitting a capacity point where finances are needed to help us make that play. Um, we can only do so much with what we have. So it's, mm -hmm. I'll let Sharon jump in and, and, and get on the soapbox because I know she wants to. So if she wants to take it off and Greg Lowe doesn't yell at me, go right ahead, Sharon. Yeah, I, I think people get the point from me, but I'll say it one more time. Um, we, 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 have, we have what we believe um, we recognize as a model that works. It is a public uh, private uh, union partnership. It is producing, it is not producing fast enough. Um, not only um, is there the, Amy gave you the number for pathways that would accommodate a cohort of 20. That, if we even were able to get $5 million, we still have to address the capacity of the training component of it as well. Because really what we should be doing is one cohort should be five classes of 20 people. That is, that is the volume of numbers that we have to get to. And not only is that a struggle on the financial side, but it also is a struggle on the analysis on the phone capacity of the union side. And so um, there's always the danger of growing beyond the capacity, but it's not just money. It is also the other side of really being able, um, you know, we get some benefactors that say, Sarah, you guys, you know, got, know exactly what you're doing here. I want to um, support you on that. We have to be ready to, to, to expand the size and the ability of this program to train people. Um, Amy, correct me, and Ebony, um, um, you definitely have this answer. I think each core application, we get three to 400 applicants for, for, for 20 slots. So there is um, a, a joint um, urgency to what's going on for us right now. Amy gave you the numbers based on 20 people a cohort. You know, folks, if we were really getting ready to hum this up, and, 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 and next year, I would love to say this next year, one cohort is three classes of 20. And we do four of those. And so, you know. And if, and if we add a CDL specific cohort too, that's gonna increase. Mm -hmm. and I know I can say this on the DOT level, we're always taking CDL drivers. They may not, maybe they don't wanna work on 81. I, I, I know we talk about 81, but the opportunity for someone as a sort of to have a CDL license and their earning opportunity in this area is beyond anything I could talk about. So I know the city looks for it. I know we look for it. I know every municipality is looking for CDL trained folks as well. So I, it goes I beyond 81. Yeah, I cannot emphasize the transformational position a CDL puts an individual in personal antidote. My husband just retired from um, UPS after 30 years at the company. The first 11 years, he loaded boxes in the, in the, in the uh, warehouse. The 12th year, he had gotten the CDL and got the training. The lives of our family changed exponentially because he became a driver. Um, it went from part-time to full-time, benefit package, union, all of it and um, pension, um, I, I just that license transforms lives. And so just the, the idea that we're putting the emphasis and people may be asking, that's not on the ground labor on the highway, CDLs are beyond that highway. And it is long standing credential that will benefit an individual long after that highway is built. And hopefully they're driving a truck on, that, on those roads. So I think I have beat this horse to death. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, Sharon, that um, th we've got some work to do behind the scenes in terms of figuring out that plan. Thank you for pushing us mm -hmm. to, to get to that level because I agree we need to get there and um, do it in a way where we maintain the quality of the program. Um, and also just want to really acknowledge Carol 
and Tim for the work that you've been doing on the CDL. I mean, Carol, you guys figured out how to do it from <laughs> scratch. And um, that's no small feat. So I'm really excited to see where that goes and how we can keep doing more of that in Syracuse. So. Yeah, and it, and it, it goes to, yeah, I was going to say it goes to the partnership. Go ahead, Tim. Well, I was going to just say that and um, guess Carol's been working diligently and creating programs from actually nothing. So she's a major asset to the center and I want to make sure the pathways program doesn't try to take her like they took Chris, but um, <laughs> Um, I just want to make sure that I put it out there that as far as the EOC goes, we are willing to expand and if possible, reallocate resources to try to meet these capacity needs. Again, we're not at that level in our program. You know, we're not apples to apples as far as cost goes, because as Carol mentioned, we're a center and a lot of our costs are already part of what we're budgeting. Um, but we also don't have all the full services that the other program does have, but we are willing to exchange and figure out ways from our own sources to try to meet some of these capacity needs. But clearly, and I agree 100% with Sharon, we have got to get up and running sooner than later of getting as many people through and maybe start to make some determinations on how much and what we really can do with what we have right now. Um, you know, we may not necessarily need to do the full pathways, may not necessarily need to do the full EOC, but something. And I also want to say what I've always said before, it's not like a broken record. We need to figure out a way to reach out to people who are already trained mm -hmm. and make sure that they're ready to go because we've been training for years. There are people still out there that may be looking to get back in it to meet those needs. Uh, Ebony, I don't want to leave you out. You are the heart and soul of this project and the efforts on the uh, pathways side. All right. Um, well, I definitely agree with the sentiments. Um, increasing capacity you get me a big enough classroom get me a space get on and teach as many people as you as you want me to um i know that from the union perspective um just having instructors that are not also instructing for their apprenticeship programs um is the other half of building capacity but however we can make this work i'm willing and i'm, I'm ready the team is ready to go uh, Amy, um, hard and fast um, reality check is, um, can you tell us we are on cohort number, we are recruiting for cohort number, which number, four, and we have funding for how many more? We are uh, through the next cohort of early next year, what we have in hand right now. So we've got the potential though for CNY works and I think Liam is if he's still on the call the CNY works I think will be able to step in for a large chunk of the sustainable funding so because up until now we've just been using grant funding and we owe can cover a lot of the costs of pathways there are still some gaps that we're, we need to fill in but um, that scenario I think there's a lot of potential of the funding that's at CNY Works at, can support this program, so. That's awesome. Okay. Um, Scott, team, workforce prep, local hiring, um, presenters, anyone on the call, any other um, questions, comments around this topic area? Um, hey, Sharon and Stecca, I do have a couple yes. to add um, around the workforce. So. I think, you know, we're hearing a lot around uh, training capacity for upskilling the community and the funding that's needed. Um, so, again, I want to reiterate kind of what's been said in the beginning is that everyone, you know, on this call, um, the things that we're doing, we, we look really great. Um, but, you know, I want to center us in some reality and what, again, as we said, what still needs to be done. So, one is the funding and the upskilling. The other piece that's going to be really important is the actual negotiated contract, the project labor agreement um, around ID1 for a few reasons. One, um, there needs to be, or I would say Urban Jobs Task Force is strongly advocating for, and these are not going to be new things to DOT, but we think it's important that we share it with this public group as well, um, is apprenticeship goals 
uh, within the negotiated contract between DOT and the labor unions because uh, from our research on some of the largest projects that have happened in this in this uh, city recently, apprentices were doing around 4% of the work. We know that a lot of the individuals, because Syracuse built for an example, and some of these training programs are talking about their pre-apprenticeship programs, the locals that we are targeting and that we want to be on a program are going to be apprentices. So it's really important that they're, again, we're advocating for goals or at least some language, but I don't want to just say language because there, there have been language in some of those other contracts that still, again, resulted in around 4% apprentices. So that's one thing. The second thing is I want to um, publicly introduce the idea of a side letter or some other type of provision around the dispatch process of how workers get onto the job for ID1. I don't want to get too technical, but I will share that on a JSCB joint school construction board projects that were $300 million, there was a uh, side letter implemented that allowed for if um, the, the level of locals were not represented in the trade unions that contractors could go outside of the trade unions to uh, pull people in to do some of the work. And why this is important is because it is possible for a project labor agreement to be written in such a way that, again, excludes the very workers that we are targeting. So I just, I've really got to stress one more time um, that, you know, th everyone, like, we're getting all this recognition. We're going around talking about it. There's a Federal Highway Administration document being put together. Um, so if we're really going to pull this off, we really got to be honest about what it's going to take. Um, and I want to say that um, I'll also just add that I don't want um, for my intent to come across as uh, calling out either our um, BOT or our trade unions, especially with the side letter. I also want to say that this would allow a contractor to do this, not mandate. So I'm not uh, proposing to compromise in any way the integrity of their uh, negotiation. And I also um, do not want this to appear that we are not in partnership, as Sandra mentioned earlier. I think everyone is working together very, very hard, and we are doing something um, that is new. But my job as advocate is to continue to bring forward to you, again, some of the possible um, barriers and solutions. So I did want to um, put that out there. So thanks to all. And I will just add as a person that um, sat on the joint uh, construction board at the time and working with um, um, joint uh, the urban jobs task force, uh, um, particularly Aggie um, around this, this was very much a negotiation. It was very much um, a discussion between the um, uh, joint schools construction board and the the our our, our labor uh, partners on the project it was a pla and and what that did is that because just um said is allowed for flexibility for uh companies who are not union shops it did not negate their um requirement to contribute to the union pool it did not negate um um um, um prevailing wage it kept all those provisions in, but it also just provided some flexibility for um, um, uh, outside, and I'll just say outside because they're not union shops. Um, it was a, a three to one ratio, three of their own folks. The fourth person had to be from the union hall. So it, it was very much a negotiation whereby we came uh, to a common ground. And I think the results speak for themselves. Any other questions, comments for this um, session, this portion of the meeting? Karen, we had a, we had a question in the chat earlier in the session, a, a similar question from Andrew Kroom and Paul Chiavari around, and this is directed at Mark or Scott. We lost Mark, I think, so Scott can probably pick up for the NISDOT team. What kind of conversations has DOT had with contractors and developers about the 15% local higher incentive structure, which you went through with us a bit, Scott. Um, and you know, what are you hearing? Reactions uh, to it, concerns, optimism? Um, yeah, I believe Scott answered that before. He, did he get that one? Yep, he got okay, it. Okay, good. Yep. Thanks, guys. I Scott, can answer it again. <laughs> no, well, that's, <laughs> that's my answer. 
Yeah, we're going to test you to see if you give us the same answer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, won't, it won't be. I work at a state agency, trust me. <laughs> Any other Hi, everybody. Questions? Hi, everybody. I just want to jump in. I'm Jeanette Zeckler. I'm the director yes. of the Occupational Health Clinical Center here in Syracuse. And I just, I'm really, really glad to be among all of you. I've been watching the work. It's really nice to be included. Our mission from the New York State Department of Health is to diagnose, treat, and prevent occupational disease. So workers who end up sick end up in our clinic very often. Not always, but they often do. And so we are very interested in learning how to expand preventive measures for this project and we already have you know national level OSHA people wanting to talk about how to how to change the lead standard and they're watching this project as an example we already have had some discussions with local OSHA who want to think about a partnership with different um, contractors there's all sorts of conversations going and I do think it's a friendly coalition work but many times our clinic is sort of a best kept secret and we're not really all that well known so I would just like to say that I stand with the working people in this town who are going to get these jobs and they shouldn't be put at increased risk, right? So the preventive work of putting trainings together, making sure the trainings are appropriate and directed at the type of work that the workers are actually going to be doing is really important. And some kind of oversight is what um, some of us have been calling for. So uh, Families for Lead Freedom Now and uh, Legal Services of Central New York, certainly our clinic and others are saying, you know, there could be an oversight person that just thinks about the lead exposure, the silica exposure, dust exposure. You know, we know that this is going to be, you know, an unusual project. We know that the New York State DOT knows what it's doing. We've spoken with, you know, the IHs from there. Um, it's not a lack of expertise, but sometimes, you know, I think that the project is going to go get going fast. It's going to get going complex. And we want to just really think about how best to protect workers, especially people entering the workforce with finally getting prevailing wage jobs. And this is definitely a racial equity issue. Am I right? This thing was a racial inequity in the first place going up. And now we're saying, oh, we're going to give these jobs to local folks who are um, persons of color, who are, you know, uh, various minorities who haven't had a chance. But, you know, we aren't going to use the full bore of the um, preventive um, you know, activity that we could be doing. So I just want to caution us, you know, like all this coordination is super great. I invite any of you to call me because we can provide expertise. We can provide courses. We can, you know, work together with folks wherever there's a gap or a, like a, many people have mentioned, oh, this is all good, but there's a gap here, you know, um, and that's where we can bring our capacities together. So I really appreciate, again, just the inclusion here today. Know our heart is with the workers and we really do believe that we can uh, bring something to this uh, big table. So again, thanks. I'm newly uh, minted as the director. We have a newly minted industrial hygienist as well, Jennifer Loveless, who's on the call. And let me tell you something, we are getting ready to go. We are know that we're losing some of our experts that have been with us for decades, Michael Lax, Greg Sawinski, many of you know them. We are, they are going to retire, but we are, we are strong and we are really willing to do our homework and get um, workers protected maximal, maximal. So thanks for uh, listening to me, and I look forward to um, participating again. Oh, Jeanette, that, that that was amazing. That was great information. I'm going to put my um, email in the chat, and uh, so we can have a further uh, flesh out a further conversation about how we can create um, further synergies uh, on the project. Any other questions, comments from attendees? Type my email because I can't do two things at once. Um, this is Sarah Nahar, and I just wanted to say uh, thank you for the information. I'm working with the Democratizing Knowledge Collective at Syracuse University, and um, every once in a while uh, my mute would go off, and that's because I was worth holding the future of Syracuse as we listen to the meeting. So thank you all very much for the work you're doing, and yeah. We will all keep watching to make sure that these implementations happen. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? All righty. We are going to move to the last section of the presentation today. This is the DBE one-stop update. Um, 
uh, I never want to take it for granted. Is Robert Short still on the call or did we lose him? We lost him. So DBEs are a certification for businesses. Um, DBEs are disadvantaged business enterprises. Still here. <laughs> Robert, could you take two seconds just to tell the group just a just a quick 30,000 foot of DBEs, the difference between that and New York State and the relevance for the 81 project? Uh, sure. Uh, we are encouraging people to apply for the DBE status, which is different than what they may already have being an MBE or a WBE or SDOV uh, status. Uh, the DBE applies to uh, fun federal aid projects. You must have the DBE certification uh, to be considered as part of the goal uh, participation uh, on, on, on projects that are federally funded, such as the I-81. So some of the firms we talk to often have an MBE status, which may allow them to work on state or city projects and meet the contractor's goals. Those goals, that, that certification as an MBE or WBE won't do them any good as uh, companies trying to get on the DBE uh, on the I-81 program. So uh, we have a person in our group, his name is uh, Troy Larson. You can, uh, we can put up the link later. Uh, he, he runs the DBE unit. We encourage all those firms that are minority owned or female owned and uh, that and their ownership is 51% or more of the company to um, get certified in the type of trade that you perform so that uh, you can participate on the I-81 project. It doesn't mean that you can't do the work if you're not certified. It just means that you're not likely to be called upon to participate because the contractor can't get any credit for you uh, working if you're not actually certified. So, uh, you know, please, uh, you know, look into the DBE program if you're on the call and you're an MBE or WBE woman owned business or minority owned business and you truly want to participate. We need uh, a variety of workers. We need people that are truck drivers. We need firms to do striping. We need guide rail. We need uh, fencing companies. We need suppliers. We need equipment, rental, rental firms. So whatever it is that you do relating to construction and some of the, even the engineering aspects, the design and architectural work that you, you may do, we need you on the program, but you, we need you to be DBE certified. And um, it's, it's, it's critical. Uh, it, it's about a $300 million contract, the first one. So you do 10% of that. We're looking to give $30 million in contracts to firms that are minority and women controlled. So it's a lot of money and that's only the first one. And if you do the math over the 2.25 billion, it comes out to 225 million or something like that. So uh, there's never been uh, participation at that level for minority and women owned firms. So we, we encourage you to, to, to pursue the certification. Again, Troy, I, I, I can give you on the chat, but it's troy.larson at DLT. Uh, dot ny dot gov, or you can contact me, Robert dot short at dot ny dot gov, and I can forward you um, the links on how to fill out your application and, and what the criteria for becoming DBE certified is. Hope that helps to some degree. It did, Robert. Thank you so much, um, Robert. Please do put that in the chat because I'll be collecting it afterwards for both you and Troy. I'll take that information and we'll make sure it's. Uh, shared with the group. So um, uh, Robert and, and Troy are the go-to folks to help get uh, companies. We had a, a, a pretty full conversation before about existing DBEs. Um, now we want to talk about the DBE One Stop that the city and the county have been collaborating on um, and identifying resources to help get new companies um, certified in um, uh, uh, locally in our community to have an opportunity on this project. Um, the, the, the city uh, will be uh, contributing funding from our upper pool and the county will be contributing funding from its general fund to provide twofold um, service delivery side to assist all of these companies that the process to become a DBE um, is not 
insurmountable, but it's not, you know, a, a skip in the park. So some technical assistance around that, some technical assistance around training opportunities. And on the city side, we're going to use our funding to provide revolving loan. And when I say loan, I mean loosely 0% or even grant opportunity. We will we'll flesh that out for support for companies that may need some um, cash flow or equipment um, related costs um, needed for companies to be able to be competitive. Uh, so my colleague in, in this um, opportunity has been Monica Williams and Monica, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to speak about where we are with the county side of things. Sure, thank you, uh, Sharon. Uh, just uh, first, I want to say this process has been uh, definitely um, rewarding, uh, interesting and grueling at times, um, but I, I'm, you know, I'm grateful for the team um, and I wanted to thank you uh, for um, Hanging in there with us. I know that at times, you know, I'm calling and I'm, I'm asking a thousand questions. I'm pivoting this way. Um, what I want to say and bring you up today is the county executive um, budget has went before the legislature. Uh, the one stop, the monies for the one stop is in there. Uh, the ledge is due for uh, their approval on October 11th. Um, parallel to that, uh, we will be doing an RFP. Uh, I have uh, submitted the scope of the RFP has been submitted. Um, it is now getting ready to be put into um, an RFP proposal to go out to uh, vendors. And what we're looking for um, will be based on our mission uh, statement that we have done for the one stop um, and also the operations piece. Um, so it will be going out um, to uh, different vendors. If there are vendors who are interested um, and applying uh, for this, there will be a date coming out. And as you all know, the RFP process, um, there will be um, an opportunity for questions to be asked as well, as well as um, answers going back. And at that point, once that um, window closes, then we will um, be selecting the vendor. So that's where we are at. And um, my hopes is that um, I was asked today how soon did I need this to get out? And I said, like, uh, yesterday. And so hopefully, um, you know, like I said, I've done the scope. It is out, it is there. Hopefully it can get um, into the RFP um, form and sent out. I'm hoping within next couple of weeks. So that's where we are. I will just say um, uh, for the city side on a parallel track, I will be preparing uh, legislation uh, to present to the Common Council in uh, their October. I hope to get on the uh, agenda for the October meeting for the uh, revolving loan uh, funding for uh, the programs that are going to come through this. Um, fresh off the presses, um, we received notification. We applied maybe a couple months ago for um, the New York State um, Economic um, ESD uh, is, are looking to increase the capacity and it's not quite related, but I'll tell you how I believe it's related. Um, the capacity of currently certified New York State MWBEs between who have net revenues of between uh, 500,000 a million dollars. The idea is that they, 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 what must have happened is that the state began to look at their contracts and look at the pool of um, companies that were eligible uh, MWBEs for these contracts to bid either as GCs or to be subcontractors. And so uh, RFP was let out um, uh, across the state. Syracuse applied. Um, to uh, operate what is called a business, a business growth accelerator. And it, we have to, as a requirement of the RFP, identify two regions, of course, central New York, but we also looked at um, and identified the Mohawk Valley region as the two regions we will work with. Why is that important to this? Because many of those are established MWBEs in the state, uh, state system, and we want to do some building uh, capacity building, but many of them we probably will find are not DBE certified. So here is a, yet another pipeline of potential companies that will be able to get to Robert Short and to Troy over at uh, our partners over there uh, next door so that we can get them certified uh, and ready for this uh, project. The um, 
program that we were just awarded for, and it's all contingent upon us getting all the contract stuff together, but the program is focused on mainly construction related fields. So really thinking about construction related needs of businesses and increasing their capacity. So everything is right on time. I see the absolute synergy of these two programs. The New York State program is for one year, but I, I have no doubt we're gonna blow their socks off and they're gonna wanna renew with us again. Um, and with that, I will take any, Monica and I, any questions around the DBE one stop. Righty. So with that, um, boy, you guys were right on target with time today, and we still had a very full conversation on various topics. I will get turn this over uh, to the mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, wow, there was a lot there. So uh, I'm I'm not going to attempt to summarize it all. Uh, I I will lift up a, a few kind of reoccurring themes. I think um, one was just the the overall need to continue to engage with DBEs um, for education, for certification, contract prep, uh, and just overall networking. Um, on that note, uh, we've got the, the state committed to an, another outreach event for DBEs in November, so we'll all keep an eye out for, uh, for the details on that. Again, uh, can't overstate the, the importance of, uh, of that continued engagement and outreach. Um, to quote the deputy mayor, resources, resources, resources. Um, the good news is they're out there uh, in, in ways that they, you know, that certainly I don't think I've ever seen in, in my time doing this work, and I think probably most can say the same, um, but we need to make sure that we're securing those resources um, and, and using them not only to support our existing programs, uh, but to scale our programs because the, the need is only going to grow um, and that it goes far beyond uh, the Interstate 81 project. There's a lot of other projects in the pipeline uh, uh, that uh, will uh, allow for uh, opportunities for many years to come uh, for, for people that we bring th through these programs. So uh, identifying the resources, securing those resources, supporting and scaling the programs uh, that we know are working, also continuing to refine those programs to make sure uh, that we're learning uh, along the way and, and maximizing uh, the value uh, for everyone. Um, again, lots more uh, to uh, uh, um, to unpack, and you know, we ha we have been recording this meeting, so uh, we'll make sure that we continue to do that. Um, uh, I do want to, and I'm looking at the chat to make sure Greg includes it. Um, he included just included uh, there it is um, the link uh, for information on contracts and incentives uh, on DOT's website, uh, as well as the specific contact information at uh, NISDOT uh, for, uh, for DBEs. Uh, finally, just want to mention that um, we will have our next big table meeting sometime in, in mid-December. Uh, and at that point, you know, based on NISDOT's timeline, uh, I, I expect that some a level of work will, uh, will likely be underway, which is uh, exciting and terrifying all at the same time. More exciting, though. Um, so again, just want to thank everybody who participated. Specific thanks to our uh, to our presenters, uh, Deputy Mayor for facilitating the meeting. Uh, again, Mark uh, and his team, Scott at, at NISDOT for continuing to share information uh, and collaborate. Um, our other presenters talking about some of the other uh, um, impacts and opportunities, uh, specifically within the community, and continuing to center us on ensuring that we're focusing our efforts on those most directly impacted, particularly those living within the shadows uh, of the viaduct. Um, also want to uh, recognize our, our, our uh, labor leaders, our, our trade unions that have willingly been at the table uh, from, from day one and, and continue to be, and uh, we, we could not do any of this work without them. Again, uh, lots of other partners to, to acknowledge and thank, but uh, um, I'll, I'll stop for now and just uh, give one more general thank you to all of you and look forward to continuing to keep in touch and continuing to do the good work and to get people to work. So with that, farewell. See you soon. Bye-bye.